Good evening, dear brothers and sisters and friends, and welcome to our online Bible study. And this is your host, Brother Roland de La Paz. We welcome you here on our uh, online Bible study, regular Bible study on Tuesdays and Thursdays, and all our uh, participants in Zoom, in Facebook Live, and in the, our YouTube channel. And to start with our program, program, I would like to ask everyone to please join us in a moment of prayer. Our Father in heaven, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you for another privilege to study your words, the Bible, the testimonies, and in the history as we are going to another episode of our series, The Church History. Please send your Holy Spirit and give us heavenly understanding. Bless all those who are participants and all those who have the chance to watch this presentation and may the Holy Spirit continue to work in our hearts and our minds that we will understand fully your uh, your will and uh, forgive us from all our sins as always takes in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, welcome po sa ating mga kasama sa lahat na nakatutok uh, sa oras po ito sa ating Facebook Live at uh, ganoon din. Uh, sa mga makakapanood ko nito. So again, uh, we are now on our uh, series of church history. And after we studied the history of Adventism and then Adventism and Reformation and Organization, now we come to the study of revival and reformation based on the Bible and the testimonies. So the brothers and sisters, we start our Topic for tonight, and then it, again, it is entitled Revival and Reformation. And this is the Divine Predictions, Part 1, Revival Reformation. We are now on Topic 255. So, sana po, ayan na ang bawat isa. I would like to welcome all our viewers from Japan, from China, from Malaysia, from Nepal, from Vietnam, and from India, from Sri Lanka, and from the Philippines. And uh, as we continue with our uh, study on the series of uh, church history, we are now in the revival and reformation. And why revival is refor and reformation is essential for our salvation, especially while we are waiting for the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is a very uh, timely topic. So now I would like to start with the Bible verse found in Leviticus Chapter 26, verse 23. And if ye will not be reformed by me by these things, but will walk contrary unto me, verse 24, then we, will I also walk contrary unto you and will punish you yet seven times for your sins. This is uh, the message of our dear God to his servant and Moses to his people, the Israelites in the Old Testament. And God wants them to be reformed not only in our time, even as early as in the time of the ancient Israel or in the Old Testament, God always wanted his people to be reformed. And if they will walk contrary against God, then God will also walk contrary against them and will punish yet seven times. So when we talk about seven, of course, in the Bible, is about a number of complete uh, completeness. And if the punishment will be seven times in the near future, there is a, a play or a, the wrath of God in the form of the seven last plagues. So we want, we don't want to walk contrary unto the will of God. And we will not want, don't want to be punished yet seven times. So we want to be saved and we want to be reformed according to the working of the Holy Spirit. So. I would like to discuss about and talk about the definition of revival and reformation. There are times for us, the Seventh-day Adventists, we are uh, too anxious, we are too uh, defensive, or shall I say, we don't want to hear the word reformation. But it is in the Bible, in the, it's in the, testam in the New, uh, Old Testament, also in the testimonies, because there are times that we become prejudiced because there are several uh, groups that uh, came out from the Seventh-day Adventists, and they call themselves Reformation. But what is revival and Reformation in the biblical sense and 
according to the testimonies. So we quote, Review and Herald, February 25, written in 1902. A revival and a reformation must take place under the ministration of the Holy Spirit. In other words, it is only through the working or the leading of the Holy Spirit that there will be a true revival and reformation in, the, in God's people or in us personally. Revival and reformation are two different things. Revival signifies a renewal of spiritual life, a quickening of the powers of mind and heart, a resurrection from the spiritual death. So, ang um, revival at reformation daw po, ito ay kailangan sa pangangasiwa ng Holy Spirit. Ang tunay na revival at reformation. At uh, ito ay di magkapareho. Misa tayo mga Seventh-day Adventists, ayaw natin na salitang reformation dahil maraming lumabas sa SDA na mga nag-reform. Pero ano ba talaga ang revival at reformation? So ang revival, kapag nangihina ang ating spiritualidad, kailangan mag-resurrect, mabuhay na mauli. And reformation signifies a reorganization, a change in ideas, theories, habits, and practices. In other words, uh, the last study that we had is a renovation, an improvement, a change. Now, uh, the testimony is telling us a change in ideas, theories, habits, and practices. So this is the, uh, the exact definition of revival and reformation that God's people need so that we will be reformed. We need first to be revived because we are actually in a lukewarm condition, the Laodicean church, we remember, and we are spiritually dead. So we need a revival of our spiritual life, a renewal and a quickening of the powers of mind and heart. So we proceed to the uh, second part of this uh, passage. Reformation will not bring forth the good fruit of righteousness unless it is connected with the revival of the Spirit. So again, the Spirit of God is again mentioned. So it is really through the ministration of the Holy Spirit that we will be revived and uh, be revived. Uh, revival and reformation are to do are to do their appointed work, and in doing this work, they must blend. So it is a combination of these two uh, two appointed work or two important uh, elements of our renewal of our conversion that needs to be uh, experienced or be seen in our life. So we need to experience revival. We need to experience reformation under the leading of the Holy Spirit. So kailangan po ang revival at ang reformation, ito'y maganap sa pangunguna po ng Balan ng Espiritu. So again, <clears throat> we proceed with the history and we summarize the history of Adventism and how God wants us to understand the true meaning of reformation why there is a call for the Seventh-day Adventists or the people of God uh, to, to, to be reformed. So then, <clears throat> let's start with 1844, the, the date when there was a bitter disappointment with the, the appointment, uh, disappointment with the Millerites, and then from 50,000 or more than 50,000, there remained a remnant from this group of 50, and in that time, that was 1844. We read in early writings, page 239, a spirit of solemn and earnest prayer was everywhere felt by the saints. A holy solemnity was resting upon them. Angels were watching with the deepest interest the effect of the message and were elevating those who receive it and drawing them from earthly things to obtain large supplies from salvation's fountain. God's people were then accepted of him. Jesus looked upon them with pleasure for his image was reflected in them. So this is what the testimony is telling us or the Spirit of God is telling us in 1844. After the bitter disappointment, God's people, remnant few, it started with 50 in number, a very small number compared to the a population of the whole world. And yet Jesus looked upon them with pleasure. For his image 
was reflected in his uh, little flock or this uh, very few faithful ones. So we continue with the stimulus for the church, volume five, page uh, 534. The same year, we were indeed a peculiar people. We were few in numbers, without wealth, without worldly wisdom or worldly honors. And yet we believe God and were strong and successful, a terror to evildoers. Our love for one another was steadfast. It was not easily shaken. Then the power of God was manifested among us. The sick were healed and there was much calm, sweet, holy joy. So this is the experience actually of God's people indeed a peculiar people when it was uh, described at that time. So that was in 1844. We remember also in the day of Pentecost during the apostolic church, apostolic era, when there were around 120 believers uh, in one room and, and the Holy Spirit in the form of a, a fire like a tongue was poured at the, unto them. So, it is a similar uh, situation, or we may uh, compare these uh, two events uh, ha that happened in, the, in two different time or era, and yet God was reflected in their character. And uh, they were actually called the terror to evildoers. So they are commandment keepers. They believe in God, and the fruit of their faith is obedience to the truth that they receive. Few in numbers, without wealth, without worldly wisdom or honors. So we proceed eight years later in 1852. As I have of late looked around to find the humble followers of the meek and lowly Jesus, my mind has been exercised. Many who profess to be looking for the speedy coming of Christ are becoming conformed to this world and seek more earnestly the applause of those around them than the approbation of God. They are cold and formal, like the nominal churches from which they but a short time since separated. Then this was the time actually of the Millerite movement. And uh, we remember that history of the, of the Christian church or uh, the history of Millerism and Adventism, when all the Protestant churches were gathered together, united, that they were uh, seeking the truth and uh, keep on studying the Bible to have a greater light uh, so that they will be prepared for the second coming of our Lord. So it again uh, was mentioned, was mentioned in this uh, testimony of the passage that the it was referred to or compared to when they were in the nominal churches from this but a short time since separated. The words addressed to the Laodicean church describe their present condition perfectly. So this is actually the Revelation chapter 3, verses 14 onwards, about the last church, the seventh church of the seven churches, which is actually pointed or described. It, it described the Seventh-day Adventists or God's people from 1844 until the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So uh, in 1852, there was a change from the reflection of uh, the righteousness of our Lord Jesus Christ eight years later, and then this is what happened. So we proceed with 1890. In 1890, Science of the Times, April 21, 29 years ago, with many, when many were predicting that the nations would never again raise their sword among themselves, and there would be no more war, the following impressive warning was given. And what was the warning? The tempest is coming and we must get ready for its fury by having repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord will arise to shake terribly the earth. We shall see troubles on all sides. Thousands of ships will be hurled into depths of the sea. Navies will go down and human lives will be sacrificed by millions Fires will break out unexpectedly, and no human effort will be able to quench them. The palaces of earth will be swept away in the fury of the flames. I underline that uh, uh, those uh, sentences because they are very important uh, in the study of revival and reformation. So this is actually a prophecy that there will be a, there will be 
uh, catastrophes. There will be fires, and then and then unexpectedly that no human effort will uh, be able to quench. So disasters by rail will become more and more frequent. So this is about the train trips. Uh, confusion, collision, and death without a moment's warning will occur on the great lines of travel on any form of transportation. The end is near, probation is closing. As early as 1890, there was a warning that there will be this uh, signs of the times or the uh, or or the realization or the fulfillment of what is written in the signs of the times in Matthew chapter 24, Luke chapter 21. So what happened now is uh, the fire will break out unexpectedly. So this is a prophesied. This is uh, to be fulfilled. Then this must be fulfilled. Otherwise, the messenger is not a true prophet or the prophetess. So this was 29 years ago. This is what she mentioned. So ito po yung hula na nangyari noong 1890, sabi po, 29 years ago, yun nga daw po nangyari, ang mga hula at pagkatapos ay magkakaroon ng hula po, kaguluhan o mga mga hunos o mga pinatawag na apoy na hindi ma, 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 ma hindi po mapapatay o kaya ay mapapahinto ng anumang, ng sinuman na tao. No? So, so ito po ang sinasabi. So then we proceed with 1892. So the time of Tessus Janapa is just upon us. For the loud cry of the third angel has already begun in the revelation of the righteousness of Christ, the sin-pardoning Redeemer. If you remember in the series of church history, there was a time in 1888 when the majority of the leaders of the Seventh-day Adventists, they rejected the teaching or the doctrine from the heavens, which is actually the a faith, uh, righteousness by faith or the revelation of Christ, our righteousness with Alonso Jones and uh, Wagoneer uh, as the instruments of our dear God. And at that time they were rejected. So it was in this time that the fulfillment of the loud cry of the third angel, which is in Revelation chapter 18, the another angel of Revelation 18, uh, started or commenced. So this is the beginning of the light of the angel whose glory shall fill the whole world. So it is during the time of the revelation of the righteousness of Christ, one of the main doctrines of the Seventh-day Adventists, that it was uh, in the fulfillment of this was in 1888, and then it was written in 1892. We quote also, Selected Messages, Volume 1, page 362. So we proceed with 1893, one year later, and thou, Copernol, referring to the Seventh-day Adventists, who have had great light, which are exalted unto heaven in point of privilege, shall be brought down to hell. For if the mighty works which have been done in, uh, in thee had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. So uh, we quote also Matthew chapter 11, verses 23 and 24. So in the review and era of August 1, 1893, this was the description of the uh, heavenly messenger of or the prophetess of our dear God on how she described Copernum, how she described a seven-day Adventist and compared Copernum and seven-day Adventist. And now the point is because of this, uh, their great privilege and are exalted unto heaven, in point of privilege, shall be brought down to hell. So this is actually a great warning, a, a, a warning for God's people in 1893, that they were compared to Copernum and how Jesus Christ left the, uh, the temple of Jerusalem, even though the Israel or uh, uh, is the chosen people of God. And the Jews were so proud of this, and they actually rejected even the Messiah, even our Lord Jesus Christ. So Jesus, our Lord, needs to look for uh, uh, a simple people, and these are actually the 12 disciples. So this is the warning in 1893. So we proceed with 1901. 1901, uh, written testimonies of for the church, volume 8, page 1991. I feel a terror of soul as I see what a past hour publishing house has come. So referring to the Review and Herald publishing house, 
The presses in the Lord's institution have been printing the soul, destroying theories of Romanism and uh, other mysteries of iniquity. The office must be purged of this objectionable matter. I have been almost afraid to open the review, fearing to see that God has cleansed, has cleansed the public singing house by fire. So ito po yung pangitain na masusunog po ang public singing house. Dahil merong mga uh, nalimbag na mga teorya ng Romanism o ng Roman Catholic Church o kaya po ng Mysteries of Iniquity, ang kasamaan. So this is actually what was written in the testimonies. So we proceed with 1902. A year later, what happened? The buildings of the Review and Herald in Battle Creek, Michigan, before the fire on December 13, 1902. See this uh, picture inserted was Dr. John Harvey Kellogg, the uh, medical director of the uh, Battle Creek uh, Sanitarium. So what happened? Two big institutions were actually uh, burned and destroyed by fire. And according to the history of the Seventh-day Adventists or Adventists or the Church of God, so this is actually an, a warning, an alarm from God that God's people should uh, repent and return from their backsliding. So in a special testimony series B, number seven, page nine, how true is the solemn statement, my people know not the judgment of the Lord. He, has not this been repeatedly demonstrated in Battle Creek? Have not men stood up in public assemblies and ridiculed the idea that the burning of our two largest institutions was a reproof and a judgment from God, referring to the publishing house, or Review and Herald publishing house, and the Battle Creek Sanitarium? Could they have seen the presentation given me of what will be in the future, their ridicule would suddenly have turned to warning. So ito po yung uh, muling babala na pinalala po ng propetisa na ang kanyang bayan ay hindi nalalaman ang kahatulan ng ating Panginoon. Nasunod na po Review Herald, nasunod na rin ang Battle Creek Sanitarium. So hindi pa nila na, na mamalayan na ito yung mula sa Diyos. So then we proceed to 1904, and then Testimonies of Volume 9, page 97. Seventeen years ago, it was said, The time is nearing when the great crisis in the history of the world will have come, when every mo movement in the government of God will be watched with intense uh, interest and inexpressible apprehension. In quick succession, the judgment of God will follow one another, fire, flood, earthquake, and war with war and bloodshed. Oh, that the people might know the time of their visitation. So fire, flood, earthquake, with war and bloodshed was again uh, prophesied and given as a warning so that uh, God's people will turn back from their backslidden uh, condition. Ito po yung panawagan, 1904, minus mo yung 17 years, ano po? Ito nga ang ngayon, ang pinutukoy mo ay ang mga magaganap na mga uh, trahedya. So this is actually what the testimony is telling us. So we move to 1909. Five years later, or in the year 1909, she solemnly charged the representatives at the General Conference Assembly to prepare their hearts for the terrible sins of strife and oppression beyond anything they had conceived of, soon to be witnessed among the nations of the earth. She said, very soon the strife and oppression of foreign na nations will break forth with an intensity that you do not now anticipate. Five years after this prediction was made, the Great War, World War was precipitated. So then, uh, five years ago, that was actually the uh, previous slide, 1904, and then, Five years later, uh, what happened? 1909 plus five is 1914. Then the prediction was fulfilled, or the prophecy was fulfilled, and then the Great War, the Great World War, as we commenced. So this is World War One, based on the warning that God given through His messenger and how He wanted His people the uh, professed people of God, Seventh-day Adventists in those times. In 1913, 
While these calamities were witnessed among the nations of the earth, another seed was presented. So we already learned of these uh, signs of the times and then earthquakes, fire, and then uh, war and bloodshed. And then there are, there are additional calamities. So, and then in this, uh, in this state, God gave um, again a message to his people. So, another sin was presented. And what is the sin? A great reformatory movement among God's people. In other words, God's people is referring to the Seventh-day Adventists. Among the Seventh-day Adventists, there, is, um, there was a, a, a prophecy, a prophesied reformatory movement, a great reformatory movement. She said, I have been deeply impressed by the sins that have recently passed before me in the night season. There seemed to be a great movement, a work of revival going forward in many places. So this is what the spirit pen wrote. Our people were moving into line, responding to God's call. God calls upon those who are willing to be controlled by the Holy Spirit to lead out in a work of thorough reformation. I see a crisis before us, and the Lord calls for his laborers to come into line. Every soul should now stand in a position of deeper, truer consecration of God than during the years that have passed. Do not the scriptures call for a more pure and holy work than we have yet seen? May 19, 1913, General Conference Bulletin, Time and the Work, 1919, page 120. So you will see this in the archives of the Seventh-day Adventists. So this is what was prophesied. And there will be a great reformatory movement among the Seventh-day Adventists. So we continue with 1913. The work which the church has failed to do in a time of peace and prosperity, she will have to do in a terrible crisis. Of course, the church here referring to God's people, the Seventh-day Adventists. But let us remember, within the Seventh-day Adventists, there will be a great reformatory movement as uh, it was prophesied. So the warnings that worldly conformity has silenced uh, or withheld must be given under the fiercest opposition from enemies of the faith. This day is just before us. The members of the church will individually be tested and proved. Again, members of the church or the Seventh-day Adventists will be uh, individually be tested and proved. They will be placed in circumstances where they will be forced to bear witness for the truth. So Christian Service, page 158. So it was prophesied in 1914. Uh, we see the dates from uh, 1901, 1902, 1904, 1909, 1913. So several warnings from the Spirit of God through his delegated messenger. Uh, he really gave to the to his people. So the Seventh-day Adventists again. It was a prophesied. It was uh, God warned his people that they will be individually, individually tested and approved. So we continue with this uh, question. Can the church fall? Sometimes we come to the point and we conclude that God will not leave his people. His peculiar people, his beloved people, uh, uh, Israel. But what happened in the time of Jesus Christ when he left the church of, or Jerusalem? Because they did not receive him as the Messiah. They did not accept him until the time of the stoning of Stephen. So there are times that we as Seventh-day Adventists, we are thinking that we are the chosen people of God, the modern Israel, or the spiritual Israel. And it was God who gave the name Seventh-day Adventists. And even if the church is feeble and weak, but the love of God is in us. So because these are written, so sometimes we, uh, we neglect or maybe we forget to study this very important question. So, ang bayan Israel, naulog po ba o hindi? Si Yeso Cristo ba'y lumabas sa Jerusalem? Na yun po ang bayan niya. Anong panahon na yun? Doon po, uh, doon po siya uh, dinedicate. Uh, 
Uh, doon din siya nag-alay, uh, lalo na sa mga kapistahan. Ando doon din ang kanyang mga alagad. Pero nung nangyari, nahulog ba? So, can the church fall? Can God's church fall? So, this is a one and very important question for each and every one of us, dear brothers and sisters. First, uh, testimony. Well, to answer the question, can the church fall? I was shown that dreadful sins are before us. Satan and his angels are bringing all their powers to bear upon God's people. He knows that if they sleep a little longer, he is sure of them, for their destruction is certain. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 1, page 263, also in Christian Service, page 81, paragraph 3. So, the, the chosen people of God in the time of Israel, even in the time of Adam and Eve, God's love is not conditional, of course. It's unconditional love. But, uh, but uh, God's favor or eternal life or the gift of eternal life or everlasting life is always uh, uh, conditional because God wants to prove his people. God wants to test Adam and Eve if they will remain faithful until the end. So what happened to God's holy, uh, uh, when he uh, uh, actually uh, uh, created the holy pair in this world so that it will be populated. But because they sinned, they did not remain in the Garden of Eden. And they need to suffer the consequences. And then we may compare with the church of Je uh, Jerusalem or the church in our time, the Seventh-day Adventists. If we remain asleep, the Bible or the testimony is telling us that Satan is sure of death for their destruction is certain. So this is one testimony that we need to uh, ponder and consider if there is a possibility that the church of God will fall. So another uh, point is Jerusalem is a representation of what the church will be if it refuses to walk in the light that God has given. Testimonies for the church, volume 8, page 67. So the Seventh-day Adventist is compared to Jerusalem. It, Jerusalem is a representation of what the church, Seventh-day Adventist church, will be. If, what is the condition? If it refuses to walk in the light that God has given. So is there a possibility that the church will fall? Or can the church fall? The answer, second answer, of course, is yes. If first, it will remain asleep. Satan is sure and certain that we will all fall. And the second point is, if we need to learn from the history of Jerusalem, Jesus Christ left Jerusalem. And he organized the church of the apostolic church, which is the first of the seven churches of Revelation 2, is Ephesus, the church of Ephesus. So we proceed to the third point. Can the church fall? The church will be way in the balances of the sanctuary. We have one of the main pillars of our belief, the doctrine of the sanctuary. So we will all be way in the balances of the sanctuary. What is the sanctuary? The sanctuary is uh, on earth in the time of Moses. is a replica of the sanctuary in heaven. God gave instructions to Moses to build a replica. And then what is in the sanctuary, we all learn from the Bible, we learn from this doctrine. So we will be way according to the light that was shown to us. We will be way in the balances of the sanctuary. From the outer court to the inner court, altar of burnt offering, the lover, and in the uh, uh, holy place. And what is inside the holy place, the table of showbread with bread. And then we have the altar of incense and the uh, seven candlestick. And in the most holy place, what we have in most holy, holy place, the uh, Ark of the Covenant. And inside the Ark of the Covenant, the golden pot of manna that had manna, which symbolizes health reform and non-flesh food. We have the rod of air on the body, which symbolizes organization and the system and order in the church. And we have also the two tablets of stones that symbolizes or uh, the Ten Commandments, which are now written in our hearts, in our mind, and also the ministration of our Lord Jesus Christ as the High Priest. 
or the uh, in the most holy place in the heavenly sanctuary. So if her moral character and spiritual state do not correspond with the benefits and blessings God has conferred upon her, she will be found wanting. So we remember, again, in the time of Daniel, in the time of Belshazzar, the uh, grandson of Nebuchadnezzar, and in the world there was a hand read, uh, writing, many, many take up for sin. So we will also be way. All the Seventh-day Adventist believers, they will be way in the balances of the sanctuary. That is why we are studying the sanctuary every now and then to have a clearer view and understanding of, uh, of what will be the basis of the uh, of our judgment or how God will weigh us. So tayo po ay titimbangin sa liwanag na natanggap natin sa sanctuaryo. Kaya pinag-aaralan natin ang sanctuaryo na detalye. Dahil kapag hindi tayo po nakapasa sa standard ko nito, ay tayo po ay, ay titimbangin tayo pero tayo po lang. So this is the third point that there is a possibility that the church will fall if he got, uh, if we will not meet the requirement of God's standard and will be way in the balances of the sanctuary and we just mentioned what is inside the sanctuary and we will all be judged according to that light. So then we move to the next point. Point number four. I have seen that self-glorification was becoming common, common among Seventh-day Adventists and that unless the pride of man should be abased and Christ exalted, we should, as a people, be in no better condition to receive Christ at his second advent than were the Jewish people to receive him at his first advent. advent. Testimonies, volume 5, page 727. So you will see it very clearly. That as a people be in no better condition uh, to receive Christ in second advent. And it was a parallel of the Jewish people when they did not receive Jesus Christ in his first advent. So there is again a, a chance or a probability that the church of God will fall because of this uh, proof or from the testimonies. So then we need we will. Proceed with the next point, point number five. Can the church fall? Because they failed of fulfilling God's purpose, the children of Israel were, were set aside. And God's call was extended to other peoples. If these two prove unfaithful, they will they will they not in like manner be rejected? Christ object lessons, page 304. So we remember in the time of the uh, of the Jews, first in the children of Israel, and God gave them four hundred ninety years in Daniel chapter nine verse twenty four seventy weeks, seventy times seven of course four hundred ninety, and it ended in exactly as it was prophesied in the book of Daniel. It ended after four hundred ninety years when uh, the Jews stoned Stephen. In AD 34. So if this will again prove uh, the, the God's people in our time prove un, uh, unfaithful, they will also be rejected like what happened to the Jews or Israel in time in the time of our Lord Jesus Christ. So the answer, of course, is yes. Can the church fall? Yes, because again, salvation is conditional. So like what happened to Adam and Eve, what like happened to the succeeding generations, we have the, the, the probation, we have the opportunity, we have the chance to have another probation because Jesus Christ died for our sins in the cross of Calvary. So we have one last chance. If we will fail with this one probation, one chance that God has given us, and then even if we are chosen, we are the chosen people of God, like the Israelites, like the uh, the Seventh Day Adventists. So there is a possibility to fall. So we cannot boast. What happened to uh, Israel? They boasted. They boasted of and uh, uh, as the uh, peculiar people of God. And we remember in the uh, letter of Paul to the Romans and this uh, wild olive, we grafted 
to the main tree, but they cannot boast under otherwise, unless otherwise they will also be uh, uh, separated from the vine, which is actually our Lord Jesus Christ. So maari pong mahulog ang kanyang bayan dahil nga ay conditional dyan. Kung ikaw ay magpapasakop, susunod, manampalataya, ikaw maliligtas. So bahay kung ikaw ay hindi tatalima, yan, magiging katulad po ng Israel. So can the church fall? Yes, dear brothers and sisters, if we will not remain steadfast and faithful until the end. So God gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him shall not perish. But even if we believe but will not obey, in James chapter 2, we read, we can read the whole chapter, faith without work is dead. Believing is not enough. But believing or faith is very important factor of our salvation. But we need the fruit of our faith in obedience and also in submission. So what happened after these several warnings and several uh, visions and prophecies? Now we go to trials, wars, and bloodshed, as it was prophesied a while ago. So that was in 1909, 1913. So soon God's people will be tested by fiery trials, and the great proportion of those who now appear to be genuine and true will prove to be base metal. Volume 5, page 136. And then the testimony is telling us that a great proportion of God's people who now appear to be genuine and true, will prove to be base metal. It's a great proportion. And in uh, volume 9, page 17, written in 1909, fearful tests and trials await the people of God, the spirit of war steering the nations from one end of the earth to the other. So this was prophesied in 1909. So we remember the, the slides or the testimonies we just discussed in 1909. And then we uh, include this so that we will see the fulfillment of this prophecy. So ito nga yan ay 1909 sinulat. Tingnan natin kung ano ang papano ito magaganap. Ano daw po? Fearful test. Trials await the people of God, which is the Seventh-day Adventists. That what, how they will be tested? There will be a spirit of war stealing from nation from one, uh, one end of the earth to the other, it means that there will be a world war. It is not a civil war. It is a war from nation to another nation, from the other end of the earth and to the other end. So it will be north, south, or east, or west. So it means to say that is a world war. As it was prophesied, it should be fulfilled. Again, nation against nation. Christian Service, page 55. I was shown the inhabitants of the earth in the utmost confusion. War, bloodshed, privation, want, famine, and pestilence were abroad in the land. So ito po yung katuparan. Kaya nga po, gera, batayan, pag-iwalay ng mga pamilya, pagutuman, uh, at po yung peste. With these words, the servant of the Lord presented the world wars and the strife that would follow as described in Matthew chapter 24, verse 7, for nation shall rise against nation. So the prophecy of world war was written in the testimonies, and now we have the, the fulfillment wherein God's people will be tested personally at the uttermost, and then majority or great proportion will be proven based method, and their faith will will uh, not remain steadfast until the end. So then, after the World War, there was a, a, a prophecy of a little time of peace. So after the First World War, or World War I, or the Great War, after having seen wars and bloodshed upon the earth, and the inhabitants of the earth is in great confusion, uh, Sister White went on saying, Christian Service, page 55, my attention was then called from the scene. There seemed to be a little time of peace. After the First World War, there seemed to be a little time of peace. It is remarkable that after the First World War, why strife that history has called First World War, 1914 to 1918, there was a little time of peace after the ceasing of hostilities. For almost 20 years, the nations lived with the hope to reach 
the unity of peace through the League of Nations, but God's seer foretold that another war was to follow. So after World War I, there was a little time of peace, and with all the efforts of these nations or the countries that were involved in the World War I, and then again, a prophecy, the prophecy of another one was again mentioned. So the Second World War or World War II. Once more, the inhabitants of the earth were presented before me. And again, everything was in the utmost confusion, strife, war, and bloodshed, with famine and pestilence, raids everywhere. Other nations were engaged in this war and confusion. War caused famine, want and bloodshed caused pestilence. And then men's hearts failed to have for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. Maranatha, page 259. So the, the prophesied World War II was mentioned and now the fulfillment. So the perspective. Christian service, page 157. We also told about the nature of the trials to come and what they would bring about. So this were mentioned. There is a prospect before us of a continued struggle at the risk of imprisonment, loss of property, and even of life itself to defend the law of God, which is made void by the laws of man. So now in this testimony, it's very clear that if we will remain steadfast and uh, to defend the law of God, it will also result in imprisonment, loss of property, or life itself, or death. So there is, again, a test of who will, who are we going to uh, obey? Are we going to obey the law of God or the laws of men? And in the time of Peter, of course, the answer was, you ought to obey God rather than men. When the Jewish leaders, they did their best to stop and threaten the apostles led by Peter and John to stop preaching Jesus Christ death and resurrection, the true Messiah, which the Jewish nation rejected. And Peter said, we ought to obey God rather than man. And in the time of the Second World War, again, it happened as it was prophesied. So, nangyari po sa mga apostoles, sa panahon po ni Pedro, sa, uh, marapat lang na talimayan namin ng Diyos kaysa sa mga tao. Ganun din sa nangyari sa Second World War, Ang, ang pagsubok sa kautusan ng Diyos o sa kautusan ng tao. So, maari ka makulong o mamatay o aagawin ng iyong mga pag-aari. So, this was prophesied and this was, this must be fulfilled according to the uh, uh, fulfillment of the prophecy. So, those who have step by step yielded to worldly demands and conform to worldly customs will not find it a hard matter to yield to the powers that be, rather than subject themselves to derision, insult, threat, and imprisonment, and that the contest is between the commandments of God and the commandments of man. Maranatha, page 200. So it happened in the first world. It happened again in the second world war. So the same test, actually, is the commandment of God. Are we going to heed or to obey the commandments of God or the commandments of man. So what are the commandments of God? We have them, 10 commandments in Exodus chapter 20. And one of which is the sixth commandment, thou shalt not kill. And we have, of course, the fourth commandment, the Sabbath commandment, which it will be disobeyed or transgressed in times of war if we will join the war. So this is what the testimony is telling us. Now the war, Satan delights in war. So if Satan delights in war, are we going to join the war? Are we going to uh, make Satan happy? Because if we join the war, the testimony is telling us, Satan delights in war. Why? For it excites the worst passions of the soul and then sweeps into eternity its victims steeped in vice and blood. It is his object to incite the nations to war against one another. For he can thus divert the minds of the people from the work of preparation to stand in the day of God. In other words, 
uh, Satan delights in war because he wants the people which are waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ to be unprepared, to be busy killing one another, to be busy persecuting one another. That is why Satan delights in war. Bakit daw nagagalak si Satanas sa uh, giyera? Dahil hindi po mayanda ang ating sarili away-away, patayan. Iyan ang gusto niya. Kaya hindi tayo sumasabi sa giyera. So we don't want that uh, Satan will delight or will be happy. So we will not join war. Because this is one way that he will uh, of, uh, he will tempt the people of God. He will also tempt the people who are unaware that this is actually his uh, delight. This is his way so that we will be separated from God. We will lose our focus, our attention to the things that are heavenly because we will persecute one another. Not only that, if nations are warring against nations, what if we are Seventh-day Adventists from Asia? And we are Seventh-day Adventists from the Philippines or from Malaysia. And then what if these two countries and other countries in Asia, let's say Japan, China, Korea, they will also join the war. And even if they are all Seventh-day Adventists and they are actually uh, defending their motherland in, in the battlefield. So the story is telling us that there were Seventh-day Adventists in the battlefield. Killing people, the worst thing if we are also killing our fellow Seventh-day Adventists in time of war. That is why Satan delights in war. Sometimes there is a question that will come into our mind. But God allowed war in the Old Testament. So what about this uh, uh, approval of God in the time of ancient Israel? Theocracy in Israel. We understand clearly that Israel of old was a theocratic form of government or theocracy from the Greek word theos and meaning God and Christian meaning to rule. So it is a government that was led by God himself, theocratic form of government. It signifies that God was their superior ruler, not man. We may ask, how did God rule them? From the scripture, from the Bible, and the stimuli references, we understand that his commands were communicated through the two precious stones called the Urim and Tumim wore by the high priest, fastened in the breastplate of the high priest. You may, re you may refer to Exodus chapter 20, verse 30, Numbers chapter 27, verse 21, 1 Samuel chapter 28, verse 6. So that is how God communicated to Israel through his servant, the high priest. And in time of Moses, it was uh, uh, Aaron and then all the Levites in the succeeding generations, those who were commissioned to work or minister in the sanctuary. And we have, of course, uh, Aaron as the high priest during that time. So this is how God talked to his people. Urim and Tumim. When an inquiry was presented to God in prayer, his reply came either from a halo of light encircling the light, a right stone, meaning yes or approval, or a cloud shadowing the left stone, meaning no or disapproval. You may refer also to Patriarchs and Prophets, page 351. Beside this, the Lord at times appeared in the Holy Shekinah, a cloud enveloping a bright light and appearing in the most holy place. We may refer to Leviticus chapter 9, verse 23 and 24, Exodus chapter 14, verses 34 and 35, 2 Chronicles chapter 5, verse 13 and 14, to prove this, that it was God's way to talk to his people through the Urim and Tumim. To make known, he will, he will see Patriarchs and Prophets, page 349. Furthermore, he spoke to his servants, the prophets. So that is what happened in the theocratic form of government in the time of ancient Israel. It is actually uh, how they uh, God communicated to his people, unlike in our time, of course. So in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 349, above the mercy seat was the Shekinah, the manifestation of the divine presence. And from between the cherubim, God made known his will. Divine messages were sometimes communicated to the high priest by a voice from the cloud. So God will communicate to his people through the high priest. Sometimes a light fell upon the angel of the right, 
to signify approval or acceptance or a shadow or cloud rested upon the one at the left to reveal disapproval or rejection. So if God's people wants to ask him if they will join the war with the Philistines, with the Amalekites, with the Ammonites, and, uh, and uh, other uh, uh, unbelievers or, uh, or the, uh, the enemies of Israel, they will talk to him through his uh, uh, servant, the high priest. Or in the most holy place, there will be signs that God will uh, give them instructions. If they will join the war, if they will uh, go to battle or not. That was in the time of theocracy. So war was abolished. Based on the Bible, war was abolished after the theocratic form of government. So no nation on earth today can boast of such visible signs indicating God's will or whether or not they should engage in war. So that is uh, what we just discussed in the ancient Israel's time, the, uh, the high priest of uh, respect of Umin and Tumim. So besides Christ said, Ye have heard that it had been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy, referring to ancient Israel. But I say unto you, love your enemies. Bless them that curse, do good to them that hate you. Matthew chapter 5, verses 43 and 44. It was Jesus Christ himself who said these words. Christ obviously overthrew the old war policy completely. And why? Simply because Israel as a people would no longer be a chosen nation. The people would be scattered among all nations. Now the Gentiles would be chosen to carry the gospel to the remotest parts of the earth. So we have Apostle Paul leading or preaching to the Gentiles. That is why we have these seven churches, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamo, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. These are all out of the Israel as a nation. They are Gentiles. They are in Asia, now the country of, uh, the present country of Turkey. So theocracy was ended forever. Let no one therefore refer to ancient Israel and excuse modern warfare on that basis. So this is a different story for the theocratic form of government and in the time of ancient Israel, when God talked to his servants in the sanctuary and in our time, especially Jesus Christ, he abolished war because he said, yeah, love your enemies. At first, they heard that hate thy enemy, love thy neighbor, but hate thine enemy. This is in the time of all these uh, hidden nations that were mentioned a while ago. So Bible verses on end of war for Israel. We may refer Isaiah chapter 2, verse 4. And he shall judge among the nations and shall rebuke many people. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. So in the Old Testament, it was prophesied in the book of Isaiah and other minor prophets. So this is actually what the Bible is telling us. After the theocratic form of government, God did not allow his people, the believers of true God, to join war because this is a direct transgression of his holy law, especially the sixth commandment, thou shalt not kill. So we are actually a brotherhood. The whole nations, we are all brothers and sisters if we believe in Christ. No distinction on account of nationality, race, or caste is recognized by God. He is the maker of all mankind. All men are of one family by creation and all are one through the redemption. So we are God's property by creation and by redemption. Christ came to demolish every wall of partition. Christ object lessons, page 386. Then today, all nations and races are to be considered as one common brotherhood. We are brothers and sisters in Christ, the brothers and sisters. Even though they may be divided by languages or social or racial barriers or cultures, and yet, according to the Bible, the testimonies, we are all children of God. So, dear brothers and sisters, may God bless us and give us understanding as we study the Revival and Reformation Part 1. After Adventism, Reformation, and Organization, so this is a very important a topic for us. So this is part one 
the next time we will study part two. So thank you for joining us and let us end our presentation with a prayer. Most gracious Heavenly Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you for teaching us the revival and reformation on how you want your people to be reformed as early as in the Old Testament and how you want us to experience revival and reformation by the ministration of the Holy Spirit and how you want us to resurrect from our spiritual death and how you want us to have change in ideas habits and practices and theories. You know, how you want us to reorganize, how you want us to go back to the, to the narrow way, to the path that you've shown your people, even from the old. Please, Father, have mercy upon us. Forgive us from all our sins. Help us to understand this study that we may know your holy will and help us also to know your true church, the last remnant church, so that we will be also a part of it to continue and finish the commission that you've given to your church, the spreading of the gospel, sharing the present to the reformation message until your coming. And bless this presentation, bless this program, and bless all those who join us this evening. And hear our prayers, O oh Lord, give us our daily bread, provide our needs, and give us a good help, and most of all, the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. At dito po nagtatapos sa ating programa sa gabing ito. Maraming salamat sa inyo po. Pag, uh, Thank you very much, brothers and sisters. And we will end our program for this evening. And this is your brother in Christ, your brother Roland de La Paz, saying goodbye for now. And stay safe and God bless everyone. Thank you for joining